It's two minutes after three, so let's start. Uh, maybe some people will still uh, join, uh, and uh, then we will see just uh, them dropping in. So this is George. Hello, I'm George. I'm from QAssurance, and I'm here to represent our company today. Yes, uh, my name is Patricia. I'm here from Open Food Chain, and uh, we also have a third uh, person who will be speaking today, and that is Eva. Uh, well, she's waving over there. Hi. Uh, and we have uh, two persons uh, here who will be helping in the chat. That is Max. Hey, Max. And we have Olex. I saw Olex before. Yeah. And uh, so just so you know, if you have any questions, uh, you can also drop them in the chat. Even if we are talking, uh, know that some will pick those questions up and respond to you. Um, so we are here today to talk about uh, the new due diligence supply chain act of Germany. What uh, is also already uh, in place in France, only uh, the regulations are a little bit different and uh, probably soon will move to the whole EU. So it's really relevant for the whole supply chain. So also for the whole uh, food industry. So that's why uh, we felt that to uh, com combine our forces yes. and organize this meetup. And uh, Eva is here from uh, the Dutch embassy, uh, but located in Germany. So she knows a little bit more uh, about the act. Uh, she's a lawyer, so she cannot give you one-on-one -on -one advice, especially for your company, but she can definitely um, give you a broader uh, view on the act. Uh, so we will start with Eva. Uh, explaining a little bit more about the act and then uh, uh, George will uh, explain something what Q insurance does as a company and how uh, that can help you to comply to that act uh, and I will uh, uh, be the last one speaking about open food chain and about our accelerator program and how we can help you also uh, to comply to this act um, and we will keep it short and interactive so if you have any questions just raise your hand uh, or drop it in the chat uh, so it will not only be uh, us speaking to you but uh, feel welcome to also uh, speaking to us so Eva, are you ready to share your slides yes thank you very much patricia and hi everybody and best regards from berlin i see cold berlin by the way and just give me a second to share my slides of course And also, uh, good to know, we, uh, to make it easy for everybody, uh, we made one document, and in that document, we are sharing all the links that we are referring to. So uh, you can find all the speakers in the document, you can find the links to our slides in that document. Uh, it will be dropped in the chat, so just feel free to open the document, uh, and then you have all the information uh, together instead of loose links in the chat. If you cannot open it somehow, uh, then please uh, let Max know. So Max, if you can drop your email separately from the document, that would be great. Let me know if you can see the first slide. Yeah, we can. OK, perfect. So let me introduce myself first. My name is Eva. I am the startup and scale-up liaison officer at the economic department of the Dutch embassy here in Berlin. So I support Dutch startups and scale-ups who want to enter the German market. And my second part of the portfolio, so to say, is everything that has to do with supply chains and most specifically with the German supply chain law. Now you're gonna see the term German supply chain law and German supply chain act used intermittently, but it means the same thing essentially. My presentation will be in three parts. I will first of all tell you where the supply chain law comes from, why it was drafted in the first place, then what does this actually mean and who is it for? And in the end, and I assume that would be the most useful part for you, is a slide with resources. Resources in terms of information points where you can reach out and request and search for the kind of information that will be useful for you and specifically for you. So with this, let me start with where does it come from? So we do have the UN and the OECD frameworks when it comes to corporate social responsibility. 
and adhering to environmental requirements. But the German government figured out in 2016, 17, that companies didn't really adhere to them. This was voluntary, not compulsory. So they said, okay, but we would really like to raise the standards in terms of human rights, environmental protection. And that's how the German national law on supply chains came about. And if you can pronounce it in German in one go without making a mistake, you're a champ. So in German, it's Lieferketten Sorgfaltspflichtengesetz, which is literally the supply chain law. And I know it's a tall order, but it is available in English. And if it really pertains to your company, I would strongly suggest you read it. It's actually on the shorter side for German law. And as of January this year, the supply chain law is in effect. The different colors you see on this map, are in dark green the countries which already have an equivalent or something similar like the german supply chain law then in yellow are the ones which are working on it in gray are the ones where they're not yet quite sure or they're waiting for the european version of the law and in light green are the ones who have adopted a supply chain law most recently and these are Germany and Norway. And with this, let's go back to what it's all about. And that, what is a supply chain law and who is it actually for? So the law itself is aimed at improving respect for human rights and environmental standards in the global supply chains. Pretty straightforward. Who does it actually apply to? So. As a company, you must have at least 3,000 employees in Germany if this law is applicable to you. However, as of 1st of January next year, this threshold will be lowered to 1,000 employees in Germany. Um, so that means you either have a headquarters in Germany of some form, some legal form of your company, our branch, for example, is located in Germany. These numbers mean that the law directly applies to these companies. But there's a second tier effect. So smaller companies and foreign suppliers are not legally falling under this law. However, the law can have indirect impacts on your business. If you are, for example, a supplier for a bigger German company who does fall under this law. And this can be quite a complex web to untangle, so to say. So I have to say with respect for the German ministries and all the official points of contact, the volume of support is quite substantial. The ones listed here are all official sources. So this is very pliable, this is trustworthy, this is straight from the source where the law comes from. And I would highly recommend you to look into it if this is of pertinence to you. So the first one you will see is from the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And it really explains what the supply chain law is all about, all the major points, all the important points that pertain to the law itself. And it also has a very useful, focused on main elements, uh, frequently asked questions fact sheet. If you go down to the practical level, okay, now what does it actually mean for one co my company? If you want to get a clearer picture in these terms, I would highly recommend the Help Desk for Business and Human Rights. They also have a CSR, so that's Corporate Social Responsibility Risk Check, for example, where you can check what kind of risks do you have to take into account as a company if you have part of your supply chain, for example, in a specific third country. This gives you a sort of overview of potential human rights and environmental risks. And the SME Compass 
is specifically tailored for small and medium enterprises, um, where you can paint a picture for yourself regarding all the elements that you may have to in take into account when you're dealing or when you're supplier to a German company that is that falls under the German supply chain law. And then to come to one of the major players in the entire framework of the law, the BAFA, that is the Federal Office for Economic Affairs and Export Control, they are the, what do we call in the Netherlands, Toezichthouder. They are the police person, so to say, of the law, to put it straightforward. They are the ones who can find companies who do not adhere to the law. They are the ones who German companies who have to adhere to the law report to. And when it comes to the procedural questions of how the German companies have to do that, BAFA is the place to be. They have a really useful homepage. It's also in English, not only in German, and you can get all the information on the Supply Chain Act. And what is also interesting, also the guidance on conducting the risk analysis. So even if you are, even if you have less than 3,000 employees, for example, but if you want to understand what a company that you are conducting business with has to take into account, this is a really good resource. And this presentation will be also shared with Patricia, and I have also put all the links into the documents that will be at your disposal at the end of the presentation. So there's um, easy to find. And with this, I will give the screen back to Patricia. Thank you, Eka. Uh, so the, the document has been shared, I think, by Olex in the chat. So there you can at least find all the links that uh, Ava was referring to. Uh, anybody, any questions about the act? Is nobody any questions? Um, I do have a question. Because um, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, starting from... Um, next year so 2024 um because you didn't mention i guess yet uh is that the um, the now we <laughs> that sounded like fun uh 3000 people um that 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 range will go down to 1000 employees right uh you did not mention it, it's right? my name is valeria almeida <laughs> Uh, that was that was mentioned at the at the second slide. Yes, that's. Oh, sorry, sorry. Then I missed. No, no, no problem. The the law came into effect in January first this year, and the first threshold was three thousand. And as of January next year, so twenty four already, this threshold will drop to one thousand employees. So that's what's significantly lower. And according to the first estimates, in Germany alone, that will mean that around. <laughs> Two and a half thousand to three thousand companies will fall under the law. One is at a thousand. Okay, okay, and um, I, I remember because, of course, we had a chat before. Is that after two thousand twenty-four, there are no uh, uh, new, let's say, standards put in place yet, right? For less than a thousand, that is not. That's that's true. That's not, no. A thousand, when it comes to specifically the German law, the German supply chains law, the thousand will be the threshold. But I'll, I'll issue a, a, a warning in this sense, because this applies to the German supply chain law. At the moment, there is a European supply chain law. This is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Yeah, it's a mouthful, really. CSDDD is what we call it. And in that document, which is not approved yet, things may change a bit, but in that document, the threshold is significantly lower. It is 450, which has, of course, an impact then also on small and medium enterprises. Yeah, exactly. And that's the whole EU. 
that's the whole EU. That's right. Exactly. And that's uh, for now, they are assuming that that will happen in around 26, right? Yes, that's that's an estimate because it has to go through the entire approval process at the EU level. And after that, the our nations have to translate it at the national level, so to say. It has to come into effect within yeah. the EU. And that process, it depends. It can last anywhere between a year or two. So we're looking at late 25, early 26. Okay. Still quite early for, especially for countries that don't have an act in place. Yeah. They 100%. have to, uh, if, if they can already make steps now, then we would already make it easier in 2026. Yeah, if you are a part of that supply chain, it's it's good to really look, look into it now. Uh, I, I saw like a pop-up uh, of a question. I think it's about, uh, Eva, the... Um, the European Act that is not that is still being written at the moment is that link also in the document? No, that link is not in the document because the document itself, the version where it is now, it's not public yet. Oh. You, you can I can add it um, as well in the presentation that I will send you. Um, it's for information only, you know, because the text may change, the provisions may change a bit. Um, there's no agreed document at the moment. Okay, could you maybe drop the name of that act, that SSDC, I guess, uh, in the chat, then uh, people will. can just Google it themselves. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, I will. I think I saw a hand raised. Uh, whoever it was, just unmute yourself and you can ask the question. And otherwise we'll move over to George. Yes. Any last questions for Ava? Once, going twice. No, okay, perfect. Then I will uh, share the presentation, the slides of George. Let's see. Da, 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 da. There we go. And you all see the slides. Oh, it's presenting now. Yeah. And then I will do it like this. Does everyone see the slides? Yes, so I'm George. I work at QSures now for three and a half years. Uh, QSures is a Dutch food tech company, but I will talk about it a little bit later. So I'm going to talk about QSures as well as our product, Imus Food, but it's also applicable for other uh, other products as well, except food. Wait, I'm scrolling the wrong side. So we're a Dutch food tech company. We make food tech. Uh, software as well as hardware for uh, manufacturer companies as well as training companies. You see here in the middle you have the food company as well as quality standards, legislation, uh, the requirements of your consumer. It could be a retailer or a wholesaler as well as the, your requirements of the laboratory and your suppliers. It's quite a lot to handle as a food company and we make software to make it easier to have everything in place and a big part of that as well as like taking the whole supply chain in, in a, to account and that's why for a lot of our customers the new German act is so important because it used to be that you used to know a step before and a step after you what happens in your supply chain but now if you are for example working with a German retailer you have to know the whole supply chain by heart from farm to fork and we're really encouraging people to do that. So having that picture of Potter on each level, you need specification, quality, and standards, uh, perhaps. And uh, what do we do with that? We made IMS Food. It's, uh, it's our software platform, food safety so software platform. It ensures that you always comply to the latest standards and legislations. On a daily level, it's, it gets updated every uh, every day, multiple times a day, and it works on the principles of Plan Do Check Act. It uh, adheres to uh, international standards as well as European law. That's why in the future we also have to incorporate the Supply Chain Act into it. Uh, yeah, it's now available as well because we're working together with the German partners, a GBA group in English, German, and French. 
and the whole thing with food safety is it's already uh, a risk-based approach finding certain ha hazards finding certain bacteria the approach to to find control points and see how it happens in your factory is already a risk based approach it's not a big step from due diligence in a in a due diligence risk based approach you have to see like what are the weaknesses in your supply chain and how could it occur and it's the same we already do for as well as for food fraud risk analysis as food defense so the step to due diligence is for us as quality managers or as uh, general managers not a difference than for approaches as the approach of food safety what you see happening nowadays is that uh, there used to be a, a lot of change already in the last 10 years. Rainforest Alliance, Aristrio, Fairtrade, all those uh, certifications came up and they all have a due diligence part in it. But what you see is that there are uh, there, there is a rise of completely new due diligence certifications that are globally recognized that really focus on due diligence. We had, before we had FC 2200 for food safety, they, they, that's the, the biggest global food safety standard is making a due diligence standard that incorporates due diligence uh, and human rights aspect into the standards to assure that they're ready for the next laws. The same is for the Equitable Food Initiative. It's a totally new GFSI recognized standard, global standard that has been uh, approved by GFSI Global Food Safety Initiative in September 2022. Also incorporating more due diligence factors in certification. Uh, so what we made is a whole platform on food safety, but also we're adding food security as well as due diligence as part as our food safety platform. As we see that there is a there is a need. So shortly, how does our platform look? We have a digital handbook that updates by the day. We have an inbound track, tracking and tracing uh, uh, software that's really within the company itself. Uh, we have our help desk. You can ask me or our colleagues always for food safety or food security questions. We have our own database on food safety, food security, and uh, due diligence. To, to look at what already happened before, so you can check that. Uh, as well as our checks uh, and more. If you want to hear more about the platform, platform please contact me. And uh, we, are, as, we as Q-Assurance do think that in the coming next, to, in next years, we're not only helping companies with, with safety certification, but also more and more due diligence certification. Because yes, it's now only uh, according to the law, but we think that uh, in the future, the diligence certification is an important thing for all of us to have a third party auditor actually checking if it occurs, because not only the government can do all those checks. And that was uh, my talk. <laughs> Yay. Let me stop sharing this. And go back to all oh, the faces okay great uh does anybody have any questions for george uh about the certificates uh the trainings they do they have a lot of free trainings yes. as well that that you can uh join uh i think they have it on a monthly basis right yeah we have our free uh, basic food safety training every month i think the next one is the first of may already uh like I can also send a send a link as well. Yeah, you can put it in the document. I uh, will put it in document. It's uh, a free food safety training with an exam, but don't worry, it's very basic. But it's good that everyone has a basic understanding. Doesn't matter if you're management. Doesn't matter if you're in HR or working on production. Everyone should have a basic understanding in safety. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, also, uh, always when when you do stuff like this, it always feels like you're the only one talking. So let's see if everybody's still awake. So uh, can everybody raise a hand who is actually part of a food supply chain? 
to also people that I don't know, so that's really nice. Hetty, Troy, Hazel, nice. And uh, Hazel, for example, can you unmute and uh, tell how you are a part of a supply chain? I'm just curious of the people who are joining. Sorry, I'm currently in the office, so it's not really. Uh, ah, okay, no problem, no problem. Uh, but just shortly, I'm in yeah. uh, uh, manufacturing. Yeah, and for what kind of product? It's uh, organic baby food. Ah, nice, cool. Yes. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. I'm just curious to see what what who is doing what. Uh, and uh, maybe Hedy, can you speak up? Hello. Um, I'm working uh, with a, a big uh, meat uh, producer and a vegan uh, and vegetarian uh, food uh, meat uh, meat uh, changing food proteins let's say yeah alternative proteins then yes yes ah, okay nice and are you based in the netherlands <laughs> yes we are based in the netherlands and uh, from here we deliver to uh, germany ah okay really relevant okay thank you very much okay let's do one more just so we have a little bit of feeling baby food alternative proteins really big producer in part of a german supply chain so really relevant then uh, excuse me if i'm saying it wrong Epdi fata can you unmute? See, I see that you raised your hand. Maybe I said it so completely wrong that you don't have the idea that I'm speaking to you. Abdi Fata, do you hear me? No. Okay, never mind. Um, so um, then I guess we're going to the last part of this meeting, and that's about open food chain. So um, let me share my slides. Da -da -da -da. Tab. Going once. Yeah, OK, perfect. So um, I work at Open Food Chain. Our food there is actually open this meeting. It's Marika. I saw that she also dropped her link in the chat and um, we started in 2017 to really uh, educate bigger corporate companies on food supply chains and uh, we wanted to have a combined existing solution um, with blockchain technology and we found out that it didn't really exist that was suitable for the food supply chain uh, so or it was not really friendly for farmers or we saw a different uh, challenge so um, at the end we decided we wanted to build our own infrastructure for food supply chains and we did so we um, in 2021 we launched our first live demo in juices um, yeah I'm not I'm not talking uh, with the slides at all. It doesn't matter. I will just follow up with the slides later. Uh, but in 2021, we um, had our first live demo in juices. And uh, with um, Refresco and Agnes Gernini as uh, starting partners. And uh, what we do with our infrastructure that is backed up by blockchain is we make a food supply transparent from farm to fork. Um, and uh, if you look at the German Supply Chain Act, but also the EU Act that is coming, and you just hear everywhere now that uh, food fraud is a big issue, true pricing is trending topic. So all of those things, you see that it has it has to do with the supply chain and uh, to report on that supply chain. So if you look at what uh, open food chain really does it's uh, we can uh, give you ESG reporting in an efficient and reliable way and uh, the reason why now is because first of all if you look at uh, all our challenges that we have in the world right now we should do this right to make good fair supply chains for all that's number one but if you don't want to do it for that reason, then at least do it because we are going to have new acts and you have to comply to those acts. Uh, now, at the moment, you have like regulations or some kind of uh, 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 guidelines to report on SDGs, for example. But now you see that 
uh, that that it's really going to be regulations like in law, so you have to comply to them. Um, in that sense, we offer a solution, just like George uh, offers also a part of the solution. Um, we can offer you that. And to show you in a really simple image is how it works now, for example, is you have a farmer who has uh, maybe a farm management system, so they already have data. Then uh, that data stays in their own farm. They don't really share or it's not uh, going to the trader where it stays with themselves. The trader maybe has an Excel sheet. The manufacturer has an REP and then the retailer maybe also has an RB and then it ends up somewhere with the consumer. Uh, so now it's not aligned. It goes everywhere. The data is everywhere. And uh, what we offer is that all those um, separate hubs have their data shared on the blockchain but it stays secured so it's not that if you don't want to share a part of your data it can stay hidden so you can choose what to share and what not to share and it will be verified on the blockchain it will be time stamped as we call it so you can see um to give an example for the juices that we have a live demo in you can see the orange juice farm from Brazil, you can see who added something to the juice, you can see who processed it, you can see who bottled it, and then you as a consumer can take it out of the shelves in the supermarket, wherever you buy your orange juice from, and you can scan the QR code and you can see the whole supply chain. From all the parts of that supply chain, you can see, for example, um, in this example with juices, you can see all their certificates. So for example, you can see uh, the Rainforest Alliances if they have it, and uh, then you decide if you find it a good a good um, supply chain. So in that sense, we are really a partner for the um, uh, food supply chain's infrastructure. Um, so what we offer, it's a public uh, layer one blockchain. That's a little bit technical maybe. Uh, people who want to know more about it. Uh, we have technical people here in the call, like uh, Chris Milo, who's here who would love to chat with you uh, about this for hours. And uh, the three things that is uh, really important um, is that it's interoperable. It has low costs. Uh, what with other solutions you, well, sometimes it's, at least we we offer low cost and it's user owned. So uh, our, the, the blockchain that we develop, it we see it as we don't own it. We are only the tech provider there. So if you look at the juices as an example, um, that blockchain, for it's called Juicy Chain, and it's a separate foundation. So it's not owned by us. We are just a technical party there. We want it to be industry owned, so it will be owned from that supply chain. Um, then I want to make like a small bridge. So you have Open Food Chain as the main company, and then you have Open Food Chain Accelerator that runs an accelerator program. And uh, that's my baby, so I run the accelerator program. And uh, why I'm making this bridge is because um, if you find it hard to look at uh, the potential solutions uh, to comply to this act or to be prepared for new regulations, then uh, our accelerator program is really suitable for you. It starts in November. And uh, what we do is uh, the idea that you have, we make sure it will become a market fit success. So we validate your idea via industry experts. You will work with them for three days, three hours each day. Go through our methodology and really look and deep dive onto the idea that you have. And after those three days, you will have a validated solution that you can start implementing right away because together with those industry experts that are handpicked for your topic, uh, you made a roadmap with them for eight months. So what you do is you brainstorm, you validate, you have the second solution, and then uh, you have the possibility to pitch that new solution during our pitch tank event. And then uh, after the pitch tank, you get the matches of the investors, you can follow up on them, and then the mentoring part starts. There we help you to really implement your um, adjusted solution, basically. So, um, the last thing that I want to wrap up with is that we are fast, curious, and accountable. So uh, if you need any help, any questions, you can always reach out. And then the last slide is that uh, we are going for unstoppable transparency, and we hope that everybody jumps on board to make the, the food uh, system a fair system. 
So uh, I, if anybody has any questions for me, I'm also uh, here and we have some time left. I would love to have maybe open discussions. It doesn't have to be about Accelerator. It doesn't have to be about Open Food Chain, but maybe about the German Supply Chain Act. So if anybody has a question, you can unmute. And otherwise, probably it will stay awkwardly quiet and then it's only my voice. It, is there a, a, so I have a farm in Iowa in the US and we primarily export corn and soybeans on the commodities markets. And, you know, so one of the questions, immediate questions I have is, is there anything in the German Supply Chain Act about uh, renewables and carbon emissions that I could potentially use? If, if you, because you are exporting to the EU? I'm, well, I'm, see right now, I don't know where I export anything to because we just put it on a train and it goes somewhere. And, so if I knew where the products I was growing were going, I might find out that some of it's going to Germany and then I might be able to get some additional revenue by saying, hey, look, I'm running this on a farm where all of the energy from the farm that we use in the farm is comes from a farm, either from solar panels or biofuels. And uh, you know, right now there's no way to, to market that to the rest of the world. Yes, yeah, so, so so it's basically you're car you're talking, for example, about uh, carbon credits. Yes. Right. I mean, well, it could be. I mean, there could be other things too. There could be water quality issues. There could be um, other types of things that that uh, you know, like for instance, I've been farming. A lot of people around use animal manure. We've been farming um, for forty years with no animal input. So I could argue that I have vegan soybeans, and I don't know where that. You know, there's potential animal rights issues there, but nobody in the U.S. cares about that enough to make it a big market. Yeah, no. So, so far as I know, but I will uh, ask a backup from Eva. Uh, as far as I know, is is uh, what they now are pushing that. Um, so, if I am a German company and I have 3,000 employees, I should know from my whole supply chain, uh, basically where my product has been so if i say like hey i sell this biological water i should be able to show like w which steps this bo water bottle made and um but they don't say yet that it has to be a blockchain system they don't say yet only uh certificates are enough but so it's a little bit free yet it's also new the act so i think it's also just still trying to have a form uh but in that sense and then, Eva, correct me if I'm wrong, there's nothing in it for, let's say, farmers who do a good job and that you get rewarded for that. I don't think it worked that way yet. Right, Eva? That's, that's true. Specifically, Troy, on the legal side, in terms of compliance, this is not specifically addressed in this law because the primary focus of the law is human rights. However, and here we come to the second tier effects. The, the way you describe your supply chain, you are potentially a very attractive supplier for a German company because Germany is looking towards more environmentally sustainable production. Um, these are the, the sort of second tier effects that they were initially hoping for as well. But speaking strictly legally, no, this is not the kind of law that would give you let's say that advantage. This is, it's more in the indirect second tier effects that benefits you. Does it answer your question? Too? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I, it's obviously I end up getting in these things way earlier than everybody else seems to be. Um, but one of the things I noticed in the US, there's a lot of the US Securities Exchange Commission has a has a program where if like if you report something to them and then they bring a case against someone for a securities violation you can collect part of the money of the fines that's recovered is there anything like that for whistleblower to sort of incentivize whistleblowing in this law um no. i don't know yeah Go no ahead. no no this is um th that would be a specific us mechanism <clears throat> Uh, when it comes to the German law, it, it doesn't function in that way, no. 
what what is the like if you do say hey i know that like aldi's is a company i believe a german owned company grocery store in the us if you see something that like hey these guys obviously don't know where they're what there's what's going on with their supply chain how would you go about um reporting that to the right people in germany through this law the authority that would handle it if you take the supply chain law as the legal framework of reference would be bafa they you have a reporting line that's true but they would always check it regardless of who reports it though you know the complication that you have in the us it wouldn't have anything to do with their all these earnings or anything in that direction it would just report that not everything is in order with their supply chain, for example. And uh, Troy, you have access to the document as well, right? With other links. I'll follow up later on that. Okay, maybe uh, Max for people who joined later, you can drop the link again. And uh, Troy, I saw, I saw that Hugo also uh, uh, tipped you on something in the chat. So maybe it's relevant as well. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. No? Yes, Stefan. Hi, <laughs> Hi my name is Stefan. Um, I'm from a company called Geocladian. Um, we are tracing or we are monitoring crops from space. Um, and uh, we are involved in this sus uh, um, sustainability issues by verifying that crops are, or certifications are complying with the amount of crops produced, for example, because often that's not traced. And Troy, um, that was interesting what you said. I think something for you is the uh, upcoming ESRS. These are uh, European Sustainability Reporting uh, Standards which um, may become a, a global standard so it's drafted by the eu but what i've understood it will go to the g20 uh, or accepted by the g20 uh, very soon and this also includes environmental measures quite a bit so i think you are probably ahead of the of the pack <laughs> as it's um uh but uh, this will pay off pretty soon i have the impression um so because that's becoming a standard maybe uh 2024 25 something like that and this has far more uh, aspects uh like uh protecting biodiverse areas uh about carbon i haven't checked it but probably it's in there as well um so it's quite um a quite comprehensive reporting standard for all and everything so it's it's for for all enterprises in general so yeah it's it's similar like the lieferkettengesetz but it's it's a different aspect it's about the reporting okay thanks um can you drop the the name in the chat maybe for also the others who yep. haven't uh, heard the the combination of letters. Uh, th did you have a question as well, or you? Um... No, just wanted to answer on that one or yeah, contribute to that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any other comments, questions, ideas, maybe? People who are looking to collaborate or need specific, maybe, advice? No? Yeah. Thank you for the. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, great. Then I think that um, if if there's nothing open in the chat, I'm Max. There are no questions open in the chat, right? Well, the only question that I saw, Patricia, was uh, someone asking for the presentations, and I will make sure to to send them out. So yeah, I don't see anything, any particular question in the chat. Yeah. No. So what I um, what also I think on the first page of the the document that has been shared with you. Um, we will also add the link of this recording there. Uh, so if you then uh, want to check up on something, you can always uh, look at that as well. And all our slides will be in there as well. Okay, cool. Then I think uh, it's time to wrap it up. 
uh, we are looking into to um, doing maybe a second part of this to see um, to, to to yeah be, deep dive a little bit into it as well uh, and, and to get a bigger group on board because uh, I do think it's relevant for a lot of people and people don't re realize how impactful this act is because uh, it will change a lot. Um, so yeah, in that sense, I think it's really good to to keep the, the discussion going and we will pick it up later this year to have a second version of this meetup. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions uh, to George, feel free to reach Please out. Email, call, whatever. Yeah, the link of Ava is also in the document, so you can uh, look her up as well. And uh, me, I'm also in there. So uh, feel free to ask anything and uh, maybe see you next meetup then. Thank you for joining.